Hello, I'm Stephen Galpin and this is Property Question Time. Joining me today to answer your property related questions are Paul Doran Jones, Director of Town and Country Property Auctions. Welcome to you. Hi, Stephen. First time on Property Question First time, time, yeah. Well, we'll try and be gentle. And uh, on your right is Jamie Pritchard, coming back for, I think, for a second time, isn't it? It is a second time. Um, Director of Sales for Glen Hawk Short Term Property Finance Providers. So, welcome to you both. Um, and we'll get straight on with the questioning. And the first question will go to Paul. And it's this. I understand that when contracts are exchanged at the point of a property being sold at auction, it's usual to be required to complete within the next 28 days. However, if one finds it impossible to complete in that time, do auctioneers issue a notice to complete as in normal contractual sales process, which I guess would allow extra time? Yes, it's a good question. Um, yes, in short, they do. Um, they do um, serve a notice to complete if you uh, cannot complete within the 28 days. Um, but there also is um, the ability to negotiate perhaps prior to auction um, to extend that completion date uh, uh, past the 28 day period, um, still on an auction treaty. Um, hence, and giving another route to give more time to the buyer to complete. Okay, I guess it's everybody's worst nightmare, isn't it? You know, you buy something at auction, you think you've got everything in place and something crops up. And, uh... Exactly, and it's something that's quite frequent. You know, there's always something comes out of the woodwork in, in any property transaction, whether it be auction or not. So I think, um, you know, look, we, we try to get things done within 28 days, but there is that fallback of notice to complete. Um, and there, again, there is the opp opportunity to extend the completion date yeah. uh, by agreement. I suppose in some ways, you, you know, we're suffering from a sort of change in attitude of, of lenders. I know some are now quite keen to lend on, on auction purchases, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're asking for a sort of in principle commitment, aren't you? Which, which leaves some of the questions unanswered till you've actually bought it, like the purchase price, for mm. instance. So it's, it's quite difficult, I suppose. It is difficult. And I think it's one that Jamie and I uh, have been discussing. It's, it's something that we're constantly trying to find ways to fund these transactions and open the market to different buyers. Um, but I think getting your uh, agreement in principle with lenders or approaching them prior to auction and getting all your ducks in a row yeah. really gives you a kind of a, a you know a, a really solid place to start bidding and winning. Yeah it's, it's about going isn't it and actually doing your due diligence beforehand and making sure that you a if you put your hand up or if you put it virtually yeah. up that you can actually afford it you know because you're committing 10 percent yes. deposit aren't you for that so making sure the affordability making sure the lender actually has got the ability to do it within the 28 days have you got the right legals? Have you got the right valuers who are going to be able to be available to go to see it? Jamie, I was listening to you two guys talking before the show, and what, what was quite interesting, you were sort of bouncing out an idea of, of perhaps rather than just be a, a purely purchaser-driven application for money, actually it could be a pre-pack for the auctioneers to say that, you know, the opportunity to fund this uh, purchases within this framework yeah and that that would help tremendously well, it would it? help because you know i work in finance so i immediately would think that everybody just knows how finance works but mm. i've never met one person actually wants to take out finance they want to buy that thing that they're buying at the auction mm. it just happens to be if they're not able to buy it with cash then they do need finance so giving them a pack, let's say, that actually shows them this is what you need to do. It also guides them through what their lawyers would expect and what the valuers are going to go and these are the areas that it can help with. Mm. Then most deals should be able to be done within 28 days. Yeah, uh, That's an interesting point. I mean, obviously, with the auction process and auction treaty, we provide a legal pack prior to the auction, which you know should be considered and, and reviewed carefully by any buyer, prospective buyer. Um, but it would, be, it would be great from our perspective to be able to tie some sort of finance agreement into that framework and into that pack mm. um, giving you know prospective buyers a lot more a lot more certainty on that subject of, of your pack um, I mean we have this um, question come up almost ad nauseum on, on property question time I, I'm quite interested are, are you covered by any sort of broad legislation in terms of that pack in other words like an estate agent is 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 governed by the the, the sort of property misdescriptions act for instance does that apply to your auction pack? um it, it does but obviously the uh, legal pack is provided by a third party solicitor mm. and is to be reviewed by a prospective buyer and we strongly recommend 
you know, it's, it's imperative really that they review that and take independent legal advice. So that, legal that's two pack. sets of solicitors. Right? Yes, it? it is. So, mm -hmm. so the seller solicitor will provide a legal pack. We will obviously um, advertise or market the lot with the legal pack. You know, there is a, there is an opportunity prior to auction to to raise inquiries, although limited inquiries, because most of it is dealt with in the legal pack. Um, but I can't, you know, can't stress enough really the taking some independent legal advice on that legal pack and you know reading the special conditions. Um, the number of times we hear buyers have you know turn up to turn up to auction day and haven't reviewed a, a legal wow. pack. It's, it's I, th I, I, th I think you're right, and I mean you, you, you must see yourself even in normal conveyancing. You know, you go to your lawyer. He starts to read you the sort of report on title. You start yawning yeah, and thinking, oh, where, do, where do I sign? You know, is that, that's the sort of process we've got used to, isn't it? But well, generally, we find as well that the, the buyers put their hands up, they've won it, and then the broker will come to me, not with 28 days left, but maybe with 10 days. And either they've tried another lender or they just haven't got around to arranging the finance, and now it becomes very stressed. Yes. Oh, well. All right, Jamie, your question. Um, with the negation of stress testing for residential mortgages, do the panel think this will lead to an unacceptable level of defaults in the coming years? Now, I know we've talked broadly about this before, Jamie, haven't we? But we did. It's a difficult one. Well, it's a difficult one because what we're talking about is probably the reversing of the regulations that went in, and not to sort of bore your listeners with this, but it was the Mortgage Market Review, MMR, where it put in all these stress tests. Now, they tried to reverse that, and they have in their sense because they want to allow people to borrow more. You know, ability, house prices have gone up, but actually the income multiples, the affordability stresses have not sort of caught up with that. But it's not a free for all. All the banks have not suddenly adopted it and said, let's just allow them to lend eight times, nine times income. Um, so lots of the, the high street banks that have not even put this in. I think the more worrying part is for, and what borrowers need to really think about is that actually the lender's affordability could get really um, prescriptive in the sense of where it doesn't at the moment. So I'll give you an example of that. They take ONS data, Office of National Statistics data, easy for me to say, um, in the background, but the ONS can't even catch up with the cost of living and all the energy prices. So actually, you're probably getting more affordability than you probably should do at the moment as well, up to five times. Now, there are specialist lenders who can, not do it with the stress test and they will do it and they're adopting that but I think there needs to be a very much a care and attention that not only can you get that loan but can you afford it over the 20 years and 25 years that you may have it for. What is the normal multiple now? Well we're not allowed to say multiples but if we're just you know amongst you friends it's about probably that? about <laughs> five. No because they don't call it multiples anymore because it's right. most, mostly an excess disposable income calculator so it's not just I earn uh, 50,000 I can do five times. Generally though it is around five maybe six times at a push, but generally five times. But it is how much disposable income that you've got. So the more credit cards you've got in the background or any other higher purchases, then they would be taken off your affordability. Okay. Um, I, I mean, one of the criticisms I, I, I've had for years about or, or all this lending criteria. I mean, we, you know, we do need to encourage young people to own their own homes and get on the ladder and all the rest of it. Um, of course, we don't want to see them take on more than they can, they can manage. But you know, when all this collapsed in, I think was it two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. It it wasn't our lenders here lending one hundred percent or ninety five percent that caused the problem. It was the American subprime market where what they were doing was simply lending to anybody they could put on the books to build the portfolio up to sell it. And it always occurred to me that it would be very easy to control lending in a very positive way by simply saying to lenders, look, if you lend a 25 year, on a 25-year mortgage basis, then there's no selling it, there's no passing it on. You're, you've got it for 25 years unless your borrower wishes to... To, to pay it off and that would be a sort of self-regulatory thing and again it wasn't our banks and, and, and lenders that caused the trouble it was the Americans wasn't it? Yeah that, that, that's one way of looking at it I would say back as a lender that you know you'd have to be a bank so you know some banks um, will be funded in the way and this all comes down to a funding question so it will be done from the savings where if you're a non-bank you don't have a savings arm so you have to be able to bring in funding so is that funding going to be loan on loan, which at the moment is probably not the place you want to be, or is it going to be more committed institutional funding, someone that can back you up? 
mm. like, I don't know, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and do that. But securitization can really help out with the flow of the mortgages. So if done correctly and the right rules are in the securitization, then I think it's still a funding angle that is utilized today and actually allows more lenders and more scope for the borrowers. So, you know, I'd say back to you, Stephen, be careful what you wish for, because then you would have potentially a cartel of only a few lenders. I shall take that warning to heart. <laughs> <laughs> and, on, and on that note, we'll go to the break. So join me again after the break when uh, Paul and Jamie will be answering more of your questions. Hello, I'm Stephen Galpin and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with Paul Doran jones and Jamie Pritchard. Welcome back, guys. Uh, Paul, your second question. We often hear predictions from estate agents on the current and future property market conditions. However, we don't often get the views of the auction houses, although in my view, they are often the best place to give accurate and up-to-date market feedback. With the prospect of a recession and an ever worsening cost of living crisis, what do the experts think the immediate effects on the market will be? That's a great question. Um, look, as we've already heard, um, there's a, a huge cost of living crisis. There's going to be a retraction in the ability to get mortgages and lending. It's going to be difficult. We're already seeing in the auction uh, world an uptick in, in activity. We're getting more transactions. Sellers want that certainty. They want to get commitment from a potential buyer um, to know that the transaction is going to take place. I think one of the frustrations with um, private treaty is that you know, there's zero commitment and people often go in and you know, think they can buy something, can't quite get funding or find something else or get gazumped. There's a whole, a whole host of different the full, reasons. The fall-through rate is quite high. Yeah, the fall-through yeah. rate and, and also the period of time that a transaction takes is one of the mm. you know, big frustrations that we, we're hearing. So I think that really th these market conditions lend themselves to the auction, you know, the auction route and the auction treaty. And I think as that kind of, as that formalizes, we will get more and more interest in that. Um, so it's, um, the market's going to be a tough place, but there's going to be some great opportunities for buyers who are ready to go and people who can, you know, take the plunge on the auction route. Mm. I, I've got two questions for you on auctions. I mean, it, over the years, we've always tended, or perhaps some of us always tended, to look at auctions as a, a place for distressed sales, mm. you know, the, the sort of last resort, the repossession sales and that sort of thing. And over the last few years, it's changed to a, a sort of real open market mm. sale room, hasn't it? You know, where you have investors and, you know, even small buy-to-let mm. uh, 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 um, purchases. Um, are we going to see, because of this cost of living crisis, a back towards distress selling, do you think, at auction? Um, I think, you know, there will always be that distressed element in an auction house or in a, you know, in a particular auction because that's something that we deal with very well. The quick, the ability to sell something quick and get that transaction done really lends itself to auction route. Um, but you're right in saying that the market has broadened. Um, we're seeing developers, we're seeing um, sites with planning, land, for example, um, all coming through um, and with increasing frequency. Um, so I think that, um, you know, that will continue really as we as we progress through this market. Right. I've always, I, I was, I, uh, somebody who's always been involved in sort of new, new home sales and large blocks of flats and apartments like around here. Um, you know, I, I, I've done the sort of um, Asia Pacific um, trip, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, selling in rooms, you know, where you perhaps sell 100, 150 properties over a weekend. It's always occurred to me that why, why don't developers ever use auction to, to launch a new development, for instance? I mean, a lot of the banks, and Jamie, you'll know this, they start telling you they want 20 or 30% pre-sales before you go. Absolutely. So why, why not have an auction we, for... A... We, we, we do get, and we're increasingly getting developers who are approaching us, asking us to kind of sell some of their stock, mm. um, you know, they find it as a simplified, you know, streamlined route. Um, so there's obviously that attraction. They have that certainty, which allows them to move, you know, to move on to their next opportunity yes. with, you know, with, with confidence. So we are finding a lot of developers picking up the phone, um, you know, and we want to hear from them uh, because we definitely can help them. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good, isn't it? And just tell me, estate agents will be very quick to say, I, I, 
I don't know what the figure is, but they'll quickly tell you that it's either one in three or one in four fall through as a sale process. Mm. What's the sort of accepted fall through rate in an auction? Um, it's extremely low. Obviously, um, buyers are committing a 10% non-refundable deposit on exchange. So we have a very, very full a very, very low fall through rate. Um, you know, our auction success rate is around 90 to 92%. Um, it's very rare that we see a fall through. Um, and so therefore, you know, there's value in that um, from, a, from a seller's perspective. Um, I think, you know, the, just going back to your earlier point about auctions being, you know, the antiquated view of an auction is in a dusty old hotel room mm. with a load of, you know, interesting characters trying to buy these properties, fighting for different properties. We've migrated onto online platforms. Um, we're using Rightmove. We're, we're marketing these properties and lots in exactly the same way as estate agents are. So we're kind of, we've kind of learned that process mm. through you know, COVID and the pandemic, we had to do so. Um, and it's been a real positive change, I think, from, from my perspective. Um, it's widened your demographic of who you can actually get, even from a ge geography perspective, people are not able to get to those dusty mm. rooms and get exactly. there that day. So I think it's actually real benefit to auctions. I mean, ja Jamie, you will know as a, a, as a funder, um, and again, as somebody who's been involved in new home sales, I mean, the usual thing would be to take a sort of thousand um, pounds deposit as a reservation fee, mm. um, in theory, non-refundable in practice very unwise to try and retain it and and fight your your, your client that's buying and te you tend therefore to return it but do you think the sort of auction process of having a 10 percent non-refundable deposit might cut out some of this fall through absolutely because you've got the committed buyer then you know you've not got somebody who's just putting that in now we do have applications that fall through but very rarely do they fall through when they're in auction you've got that 10 percent. so i think that's what gives the seller whoever they may be more comfort to actually use an auction that way especially when you're actually going to be uh, reducing the time frames as well when you're going to be getting the money in their pocket i suppose you've just got to be a brave developer to say you know i won't make it as easy as possible for everybody just to put a thousand quid down and say they're going to buy it and insist on the 10%. No, I think it has to be meaningful. And I think that's one of the you know most powerful parts of auction is, is that meaningful deposit sharpens everyone's minds. Mm. You know, it, it also means that, you know, the legal professionals of which we have specialist auction solicitors who deal conveyancing, um, they have to be on their, you know, on their on, on the ball or on their money so that they can get the transactions done, but which is aided hugely by the legal pack. Mm. It is all down to conversion rates like that as well, because we'll make a commitment, you know, in our industry mm. of say the valuation. So we won't look at your application until you've paid for the valuation fee, you know, whatever that could be. And that's a commitment of sorts, isn't it, that you're putting down with. So we're not actually don't, looking at cases that won't go anywhere. Don't get me on value as I've spent my life fighting value. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lifetime battle. Jamie, your next question, which is your second and final one. What do the panel think are the financing prospects for the short to medium term within the property industry? I'm guessing that lenders will become even more risk adverse given the cost of living crisis. It is a good question. It's a question I get um, a lot and it depends on the lenders themselves. So I'm in the short term finance market and you know, they say about, is it going to get more risky? Well, short-term finance is a risky business in a sense, and the funding, so we take all that into account. Well, at least you get your problem at the earliest possible point. Don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> but from a, from a commercial basis, we've never been busier than we are now. You know, we haven't been busier, and it's, there's a lot of opportunity in the market, as you were talking about earlier, that, you know, there may be a cost of living crisis as such. However, there's still people needing, you know, supply versus demand of property and more people needing property. So we're still developing products, going into new product lines and really creating opportunity for people moving forward. I think, um, you know, there are some lenders who will um, restrict their funding. And I think it comes down to really how you are funded as a lender. So you mentioned earlier about sort of maybe Americans and how if you're funded by something by American funders, maybe they're getting a little bit nervous about what's happening over here at the moment and they could restrict the borrowing. So that doesn't as much come into the cost of living, that just comes into their appetite and want going forward. However, other lenders have got committed funds which they actually will be able to lend out without actually having to forward flow that and say, can we have permission to lend on this loan? So it's actually choosing your lender correctly 
as well. So a good broker will be able to help you out with that if you've not got the experience yourself and knowing who those lenders are going to be. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a financial expert. So am, am I reading this right? That So you've got two choices of lenders. One is a, one is a, a lender that borrows themselves or the second one is a lender that has its own funds and makes its own decisions. Yeah, yeah. well, that, that, that's, is that the simple way? To, that's, a, that's a simple way. I think it's always about, if you're trying to buy property through auction, you want to know that you're going to be able to buy that in 28 days. Mm. So if you're using a lender that you don't know and you're, you're worried that they are able to do that in 28 days, probably not the lender for you, mm. Mm. I'd say. So, you know, the cost of living and all those things to put into account, Lenders will be taken that into account, but so will the customers themselves. So will, will the lenders and underwriting change and look at your ability to service that loan? Maybe, mm. but all things that you take into account. But the lenders I talk to still want to lend. Well, they want to make a profit and... Uh... And so does the investor. Living. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, I think there's benefit as well for the applicant to get most of these questions answered before they, before they find a property or before they make a commitment. You know, they could get all of this or a lot of the due diligence done probably prior to uh, prior to uh, committing on a lot, for example. OK. All right. Well, gents, I'm going to say a big thank you to you both. Uh, Paul Doran Jones, Director of uh, Town and Country Property Auctions and Jamie Pritchard from Glenhawk uh, Property Finance Providers. Thank you both very much for coming in today. That's all we've got time for. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me next time on Property Question Time. Thank you.